Last week, I was in a conversation with uh, a good friend of mine who uh, is in a career that's kind of in like social services. And so whenever the pandemic hit, it was just like the demand. I don't know if you've talked to anybody who's maybe overseen a food pantry or some kind of nonprofit. I mean, demand has just gone through the roof as the economy has crashed and everything's gone crazy. And so I was talking uh, with my friend about his role in this organization, and he asked me to pray for him. And he said, the demands are so constant, and they are so daily, and it is so messy, and I am so tired. He said, I just don't know if I can do this any longer. Well, one of the things I've learned from being a pastor for many years is uh, I don't hop in with advice the moment somebody comes to me in their brokenness. You ever had a friend who does that? It's like, okay, I regret sharing with you now. But um, I listened for a very long time, probably an hour. And, uh, but finally, he actually did ask me for some advice. Michael, what would you say to me in this situation? Of course, I, I empathized and, and all of those things. But when he asked for my, some advice, I, I did offer some. And I said, I would just say, don't be hasty about making a big decision in a hard time. And I said, there's a, there's a big difference between quitting and finishing. And he's a Christian, and, and so I, I brought God into the picture. And I said, uh, I said, quitting is when you give up because it's hard or it's tired. But finishing is when you fulfill God's purpose in whatever season it is by the strength, by the grace that he supplies. And so we talked through this. Do you feel like you're contemplating quitting or do you feel like it's finishing? And so, and so we talked through these things. And, um, and so I, I say all that to say that I know that you're not leading some nonprofit organization, probably. But in reality, this has been a really hard season for all of us. Some of us because of individual specific things in our lives, but for the whole world. I mean, doctors even have a name for this. They uh, they've come up with a term for it. They've called it COVID fatigue. Have you heard of this? You heard of COVID fatigue? What they say is there are, there are two kinds of stress, intense stress and prolonged stress. Both of these are harmful to our health, but they say what's unique about COVID-19 is that it's produced both, both intense and prolonged stress. And the outcome is that people are depressed, People are worried, people are lonely, people are unmotivated. So my, my advice to my friend was, you know, this is a hard time. Let's, you know, don't necessarily jump to a conclusion yet because I want you to fulfill whatever God's purpose is for your life. And, and, it, and it leads, all of this leads to a question for us because everyone in this room on, on some level, in varying levels, feels COVID fatigue, right? We're, we're ready to just be back to normal, whatever that means. I mean, I almost forgot what it looks like, but we're ready to be back to normal. And so the question is, how do we persevere? How do we persevere without just quitting, without just throwing in the towel? Because one thing I know about God is that he intends for his people not to be quitters, but to be finishers. And I know that's God's heart for all of us and whatever season that you're going through, and you might be in a juncture right now where your career is extremely hard or where things are just really hard, and, and there, are, there is a time to put things down, there is a time for transition and change. All of that's true, but I would just encourage you, listen to what we're talking about today, because I want to make sure that whatever God's called you to do, whatever his purpose is in your life, that you finish that well. And so we're in a series right now uh, that is called, as you can see, Family of God. And one thing I've learned about being a dad for a long time is that uh, the older my kids get, the more responsibility they have in their lives to put on them. And like the older kids are like, this is no fair, I wish I was younger. And I'm like, do more chores. And so <laughs> everybody has a function, everybody has a role in the family, and it's same, the same with God. So in the family of God, God intends all of us to have a purpose, to have a function, to have a role. And the more mature we grow in Jesus, the more we begin to understand what that role is and begin, begin to operate it. If we're not doing anything in God's family, I mean, 
that we show that that's, that's more like a spiritual baby, right? Because babies, we don't really expect them to do anything. As we grow in maturity, we grow in our understanding of purpose. And so as we talk through purpose today, we're going to talk about what does it look like to, uh, to fulfill God's purpose by the strength he supplies. All of this ties into what it looks like to be a mature member of God's family. Uh, th- now, this whole, the reason for this series, Family of God, is we do feel as a church that that's an emphasis for us in this season. We want to do a better and better job at helping you connect in a season of great disconnection. That's part of why, as David Hayes has begun to lead our small groups, why uh, we've started with these hybrid groups so people can meet in person and so on. We're really prioritizing connection. We are always doing that, but more so in this season. And it's also the subject of Ephesians, the book, the book of Ephesians. Paul's letter to this church is about family, about God reconciling all things in Christ and bringing them together. It's part of his global family. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Ephesians 3, 1 to 13. You can turn there. And what has just occurred in the previous context, we saw the way uh, in, the last, in chapter 2, God uh, in Christ not only reconciled man to God, but also man to his fellow man. He reconciled Jew and Gentile. He broke down walls of hostility between the ethnicities. And so coming out of that, Paul's about to begin a prayer in Ephesians 3.1, but he interrupts himself. And we know he's about to begin a prayer if we cross-reference with verse 14, because he resumes it. (laughs) But he interrupts himself and he says, "Ah, you know what, I need to get a little autobiographical here. And he begins to talk about his own purpose and how that interacts with God's purpose. So let's read Ephesians 3, verses 1 to 13. He says, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner, of Christ, uh, prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Don't you just love that? Paul's in prison. And he's like, don't be discouraged by me being in prison. Like, wouldn't it be like, hey, Paul, maybe you're the one that should need the encouragement. (laughs) He's actually modeling for us, like, how do you keep your hopes up when times are bad? How do you stay encouraged when you're in prison, whatever that looks like for you? He models that for us. And he talks through, as I've said, his, uh, God's eternal purpose, that word appear, those words appear in verse 11, as well as his unique purpose. So three questions uh, that we're going to try to answer today. One is, what is God's eternal purpose? Two, why, why is that so important to God? You know, just a little question. Uh, and three, why, what do we do with this? What is God's eternal purpose? Why is it so important to God? And what do we do with it? Okay, so... What is God's eternal purpose? We'll start there. Um, God begins hinting at it, and maybe you picked up on my little verbal inflections. Uh, The word mystery. Did you pick up on that repetition? It appears in verses 3, 4, 6, and 9. In 13 verses, it's repeated four times. This must be pretty important for us to try to digest and begin. What mystery is the Apostle Paul talking about? This word mystery appears 27 times in the New Testament and only a couple of times in the entire Old Testament. 
Why? Because in the coming of Christ, new things were getting revealed. And one of, and really the central new thing is revealed in this passage, the mystery. What is it? In Jewish thought, when they would use that word mystery, it's a little different from us. For us, mystery is a hidden thing. But in Hebrew thought, the mystery was that thing that was once hidden, but is now revealed, now displayed, now openly disclosed to all. So it's kind of actually the opposite meaning. So the mystery that's now disclosed, what is that mystery? He begins to unpack it. In verse 5, he talks about the revelation of this mystery to the apostles, the holy apostles, and the prophets, he says. Now, this should remind us of what occurs just a few verses earlier. We saw it last week in, uh, in Ephesians 2.20, where it makes this metaphor of the church is like this temple built upon the foundation of what? The apostles and the prophets. And now the apostles and the, prophet, and the prophets, those foundational pieces of God's church, appear once again in chapter 3. Why? Because they're receiving a very special revelation of a very special mystery. What is it? He makes it crystal clear in verse 6 what that mystery is. Let me just read that verse again. He says, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So that's why this, uh, the apostles and the prophets are foundational, not because we'll never need apostles and prophets again. That's you know, a false teaching that goes around in the church. Paul makes clear in Ephesians 4.11, apostles and prophets will be around for all time. But they are foundational in a very specific sense, and specifically in the New Testament times, because they brought this brand new revelation that had been hidden for ages past in the eternal counsel of God, but was now revealed that Gentiles are part of the family, that God was building a global, multi-ethnic family. And this is what the mystery is. The mystery is God's eternal purpose to establish a global, multi-ethnic family. The mystery of God is God's eternal purpose to establish a global, multi-ethnic family. Eternal means this wasn't plan B. It wasn't like, you know, Jesus came, was like, man, the Jews didn't accept me. Okay, I guess we've got to turn to the Gentiles. I mean, there is a sense in which that happened, and Paul spells that out in Romans 9 through 11, but at the same time, God knew the Jews were going to reject him. He actually pro prophesied it in the book of Isaiah. He knew that the Jews were going to reject them, and he was going to use their rejection to actually reach the whole world. Now, I know that we have like a, a, a range of people in this room, some who've, you know, you read the Bible every year and others who've maybe never cracked it open or never read the Old Testament before. But to put us all on the same page, one question that might arise for those who have read the whole Bible would be, what's so mysterious about this? Because when you read the Old Testament, I mean, prophet after prophet after prophet talks about how uh, one day Gentiles are going to stream in, and one day Gentiles are going to worship beside Jews. And so if that's what Paul's saying here, what's the big difference? Why is this a mystery? Well, that's not precisely what Paul's saying. Pa Paul's actually saying something quite different. That the, the, there was never an Old Testament prophet that said that all the nations are going to be part of a global, multi-ethnic family. What the Old Testament prophets said was that the, the Gentiles would come into the Jewish theocracy that would rule the whole world, and the, and the Gentiles would come in as sort of second-class citizens. And so Paul, what he's saying here is, hey, the greatest hope of the Old Testament prophets was actually too small. Because hidden in the counsel of God from all eternity, they saw in part, and their prophecies weren't wrong, but the apostles and prophets saw more clearly that it's not that Gentiles will just come into a Jewish theocracy and be second-class citizens. No, Gentiles will come in and they will be part of a global multi-ethnic family. They will be part of the body of Christ. They will be partakers of the same promise, not second-class citizens. Praise God, Gentiles, you're not second-class citizens. 
So God's eternal purpose is to establish a global multi-ethnic family. That's what he's been building toward through Ephesians chapter 2 and this new society that he created and breaking down the wall of hostility so that all ethnicities, all peoples might gather as one as part of this family that spans the entire globe. Now, why is this eternal purpose, why is it so important to God? Why does he care so much about it? Ephesians 3.10 tells us, and it's an interesting verse, it's almost intense in some ways, and it's even a little strange. Uh, He says, God reveals this mystery so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Hmm. There's a few things to unpack just so we can even understand what this means, okay? First of all, manifold wisdom. What does this mean? This word manifold is actually used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament uh, to describe Joseph's multicolored coat. You guys know Joseph's multicolored coat? It basically means multicolored. It means variegated, multifaceted. And so Paul's using a sort of play on words to uh, to essentially say this, that God is... God is creating a multicolored family in order to display his multicolored wisdom. He's creating a multicolored family to display his multicolored wisdom. That's what manifold means. And when you look at it in its relation to God's reconciliation of all ethnicities under one head, one family, that's what it means. And so the question is, whom is to whom is he displaying this multicolored wisdom? And, and this is where it gets weird. He says the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. What does that mean? Shout it out. What do you think it means? Yeah, the spirit world, the heavenly places. And, uh, and specifically, in the book of Ephesians, we've been seeing that Paul will use rulers and authorities to speak of Satan and his demons. So Ephesians 1.21, for instance, we saw that Jesus conquered all evil through his ascension, being uh, raised up and seated at the right hand of the Father, remember this, far above every ruler and authority and power and every name that can be named. Or in Ephesians 6.12, the apostle will say, hey guys, our battle is not against flesh and blood, it's against what? The rulers and the authorities and the powers of this dark world. So what the apostle Paul is saying here is that the church displays through its diversity, God's diverse wisdom to the devil. Put differently, and I'll just put this in real informal terms, okay? Real informal terms. Church is God's way of talking smack to the devil. You get to be part of that this morning. Isn't that kind of cool? Church is God's way of talking smack to the devil. I mean, I guess, praise God, Michael didn't write the message Bible translation of Ephesians 3.10, right? Like, like, I don't know if they'd understand you right, Michael. Church is God's way of talking smack to the devil. Now, let's unpack that, because even that's, that's a little tricky, okay? Uh, we really have to understand the story of the whole Bible to figure out, like, what Paul's, and, and that's what Paul wants us to do. He's talking about an eternal purpose. He's talking about something that's been hidden in God for all of eternity. He's wanting us to see the message of the entire scripture here. So, uh, and so we... We go back to Adam and Eve. They eat the fruit. God had commissioned them as stewards to rule over the earth. How'd they do on that? Not so good. So they sin, and then Satan comes in, and he takes their rulership, their authority over the earth. Now, it's all still under God, but, uh, but Satan is, in a very real sense, becomes at that, this moment, uh, the moment of the fall, ruler over the earth. And then you start to see like mankind sinning and sinning and sinning. And you have the flood, and you got the Tower of the Babel, and you got all this. And then, and, and then so God ends up picking this guy, Abraham, and his descendants. And he picks this puny Middle Eastern tribe, Israel. And he makes a promise, and he says, we're going to reverse all that. I'm taking my world back. And so he makes this promise, but... But at the moment, what's, what's important to understand at that moment in history is that there was a sense in which Israel was God's portion and the devil had the rest of the world. A sense in which Israel was God's portion and Satan was the ruler and authority over all of these godless nations who were worshiping all these false gods. And so Satan's, you know, he's feeling pretty good about himself at that moment. 
that all changes at the cross. When Jesus comes into the world, by the way, from that puny, disobedient tribe, because Jesus doesn't need, like, you know, a royal flush to win. He can do fine with a pair of twos. <laughs> and so he comes from this puny tribe. Satan's got the entire world, and Jesus comes into the world and effectively dethrones Satan and takes his place. You remember after the resurrection? He says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Okay, so that was by virtue of his life, death, and resurrection, as we see in Ephesians 1, his ascension as well. But what Ephesians 3 is trying to point out is that this grand reversal, remember that word mystery, remember it was hidden in the council of God, it was hidden in the archives of eternity, that means Satan didn't know, he wasn't privy to God's plan, the devil didn't know what God was doing, this was hidden from him. And so again, to put this in super informal terms, you might say it like this, God played his cards so close to his chest that Satan got tricked by the master poker player. Satan bet the farm by putting the king of the Jews on the cross, and unwittingly, three days later, the king of the Jews became the king of the world. In short, Jesus conquered the world... <laughs> And the global church is evidence of that. And so practically, you came and you worshipped this morning. And on this very same day, the Lord's Day, time differences considered, <laughs> there were people in Japan singing praises to King Jesus. And there were people in Russia and in South Korea and in North Korea. There were people in bunkers as well as in buildings. There were people in fields and on top of hills and under trees and holes in the ground and in caves and in prisons and in homes in Africa and in Asia and Europe and North and South America and on all the islands in between. People were singing the praise of King Jesus. And every time we do... The devil is reminded that he is not the king of the world. He has been dethroned. Jesus is the one with all authority and power. The global, multi-ethnic nature of God's church is how God talks smack to the devil because the devil is reminded every time you gather for worship on the Lord's day, he lost. So it's a weird verse, but it's pretty cool, isn't it? And I think one thing I would want to point out is diversity was God's idea before it was the world's idea. And, and you know, there are times when, um, and I feel like perhaps most often, the world's values and God's values, and I say, you know, God's saying this and the world's saying that, and they're, they're conflicting with one another. But there are times when the world actually understands something or, or gets something, and I, I think as a responsible preacher, I want to point that out, I'm actually glad the world favors diversity right now. I think that's a good thing. It's a God thing because God invented it. But the thing about uh, God and, and his perspective on it is his pursuit of diversity is different from the world's pursuit of diversity. He's not like, you know, those corporations are like, oh, we'll look bad if we don't hire somebody. You know, like, he's not just trying to meet a quota. He's not just trying to virtue signal. For God, the reason that he is so uh, the, the diversity is so important to him, the way I wrote it down here in my notes, is for God, diversity is about doxology. Doxology just means praise. Diversity is about doxology. That is, it is about King Jesus being exalted among every tongue, tribe, and nation. Remember, just by way of example, slave plantations had diversity, but they did not honor God. For God, it's not just about mixing people together to mix people together. For God, it is about people coming together as the multi-ethnic global family of God with the praise of King Jesus upon our lips. It's about doxology. So what is God's purpose, his eternal purpose, is to establish a global multi-ethnic family? Why does he do it? To talk smack to the devil? And remind him who the true king of the world is. Now, what do we do with this? How does this translate into our lives? And 
This is where God's eternal purpose translates into our unique one and how this, uh, how this plays out. And the Apostle Paul has already been talking about uh, his unique, uh, or he's been talking uh, in Ephesians 2.10, he says, you all have a unique purpose. At the moment that you are created in Christ Jesus, that's the moment that you're born again, you become a new creation, and he says you're created to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. So uh, 20 trillion years before you were born, God already had a plan for the good works and the ministry and the purpose that you were to fill out. He began talking about it in Ephesians 2.10, kind of got away from it, and now autobiographically, he begins to talk about his own unique purpose. And here's what he says in chapter 3. He refers to it like this. He refers to it as the stewardship of God's grace given me for you. In verse 7, he talks about it as the gift of God's grace that made me a minister. In verse 8, he, sa- he refers once again to the grace that was given to preach to the Gentiles. Are you beginning to see a pattern here? Grace is not just that which saves you. Grace is that which sustains you. There is an empowerment component. Yes, grace is God's undeserved favor, as churches have been preaching for many, many years, but it's not just his undeserved favor. It is also his empowerment. Take that as encouragement if you are losing heart, if you have a little bit of COVID fatigue right now. In verse 7, he ties together grace with, quote, the working of his power. It's the exact same phrase he uses in Ephesians 1.19 to describe the resurrection power of Jesus that is available to every single believer. His point is, hey, grace saves you, that's great. But grace also sustains you for fulfilling God's purpose. It empowers you, not with just a like, minimal level of power, but with the very same power that raised Jesus from the dead that is available to empower you to fulfill God's purpose. So the way you look at it is you, you might look at it like this. If you, if you think about purpose as being that destination toward which we are all aimed, you might think of uh, if grace as being like the gas in the car. And you really need both, don't you? Like if you know the right destination, but your car has no gas, problem. <laughs> If you got loads of gas in your car, but no idea where you're going, problem. (laughs) You need both. And so let's unpack these both, and these will become sort of two closing exhortations for us as to what it looks like to fulfill God's purpose by God's grace, his empowering grace. The first exhortation is this. Align your unique purpose with God's eternal one. Align your unique purpose with God's eternal one. I've noticed that our, the, the world is kind of obsessed with, you know, my unique purpose. And, hey, like, I'm cool with that. Like, hey, we should all find our purpose. But I think what, the reason I make fun of it is because it's like the secular world that doesn't believe in God, who gives you a purpose? <laughs> you know, like, no one to give you a purpose, but you want to find your purpose. And so you have this proliferation of personality tests, this proliferation of aptitude tests, and everybody, what the, the going assumption is, if I can just figure out how I am wired and do that, then I'll be good to go. I'll find the perfect career. I'll find, you know, make me happy, and I'll find the perfect hobby to put my hand to, or whatever it is, if I can just figure out how I'm wired. But it's a faulty assumption, because you could totally figure out how you're wired, and if you're not fulfilling God's eternal purpose, it's, it's a total loss. To use an extreme example, <laughs> okay, yeah, it's like preachers. The extreme example is always Hitler. Poor, <laughs> you know, Hitler, okay. But I'll tell you this. Hitler, he was very gifted. He was an incredible communicator. As far as professions were concerned, you know, he's a way better, you know, dictator than he was artist. He found something that matched his personality, something that matched his aptitudes, but look what he did with it. You can figure out how you're wired all day long, but if you're not aligned with the eternal purpose of God, you might be going a thousand miles an hour efficiently 
in the opposite direction. And so it's not just about how you're wired, it's about how you are aligned. Is your life mission, is your purpose, is your heart, are you aligned with God's eternal purpose that far predated you? Are you aligned with it? Now, what is God's eternal purpose? It's that he would establish a global, multi-ethnic family. And this should cause us to ask ourselves, am I contributing to that? If that's God's purpose, am I contributing to that? In the very least, when was the last time you told somebody who doesn't know Jesus about Jesus? How long has it been? Are we making disciples of all nations, like Jesus tells us to do? He's establishing a global, multi-ethnic church. Are we contributing in some way to global missions? Are we doing anything for it? I mean, if you want to, you could give monthly to Cuba, give 15 bucks a month. That's fine. But we have a lot of people to do that. But are you contributing to, to God's mission on the earth? But also, let's think about it in terms of Christ's reconciling mission. If he's trying to make us into a family, a question I would ask is, are you reconciled with your brother? Are you reconciled with your sister? I find that a lot of times God's people are too content to be unreconciled because we've borrowed counseling language and we've said, that person's toxic for me. I mean, is that what, lo- I mean, hey, I get it, there's a place, you got to have boundaries, you got to, I mean, I get it, I do, but I think people take it too far, and I think we allow counseling language to make us just not have to forgive people. That's not okay, and forgiveness is just step one. That's what you do in your heart. God's ultimate heart is reconciliation. Take Matthew 5, this should challenge you. If you're laying your gift at the altar, you've come to worship God, and there you remember, your brother has something against you. You're not even the one with something against your brother. They're mad at you. Lay your gift down. Go be reconciled to them. That's how much God prioritizes reconciliation. It's a huge deal. Now, I recognize you can't always be reconciled because it takes two to tango as far as it relies upon you to be at peace with all men. But if Christ is establishing a global multi-ethnic family and it's a real family, I should seek forgiveness. I should seek reconciliation. But now let's touch on the multi-ethnic uh, component of that. It would be mistaken if we thought that the reason that Paul was in prison uh, was because he kept telling people how to get to heaven. He's not doing that, Paul. That's not why Paul was in prison. You can read the story of why he goes to prison in Acts 21, because he allegedly had Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the temple. The reason the apostle Paul was in prison was not because he was telling people how to get to heaven. It's because he was telling dirty Gentiles they were part of the family and it made some Jews mad. His Jewish brothers and sisters, his own ethnic tribe got mad at him over that. That's why Paul was in prison. So, so for Paul, this, this message was something that he lived. He, he tells them, he says, guys, my suffering is for your glory. I am in prison for talking to you, for telling you you're part of the family. And he's modeling that upon Jesus who left heaven and came to earth to break down the wall of hostility by absorbing it upon himself and then establishing peace. Guys, if Jesus is our model and if Paul is our model, we can't look at ethnic hostilities in our nation and say, that's cool with me, they need to just get over it. And I get it. I get that, like, a lot of people are fatigued with the conversation, but we can't get fatigued with the conversation when Jesus died and rose again to create a global multi-ethnic family. And so my question would be, what are you actively doing to promote peace between ethnicities? These are just a few examples of some ways that you can align your heart with the eternal purpose of God, and there are many more. But, but here's how that plays out into your unique purpose. If we live for our eternal purpose, God will show us our unique purpose. 
If we live for our eternal purpose, he'll show us our unique purpose. But why is he going to show you your unique purpose if you're like, oh, eternal purpose you died and rose again for? I don't care about that. Just tell me how I'm wired. (laughs) No. If we're fulfilling his eternal purpose, if we're laying our life down for the cause of Jesus Christ, that's the kind of person where God says, okay, I'm going to give them a little more understanding of why I put them on this earth. Apply yourself to God's eternal purpose and you, he will reveal to you your unique one. So we've talked about the direction side of things. And now here is the last one. And this, uh, this deals with the gas tank. What do I do if my car is sputtering? What if I do if I'm COVID weary? Here's what I would say. Posture yourself to receive God's grace. Posture yourself to receive God's grace. Receiving God's grace is all about posture. God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. It's repeated multiple times in the Bible. It's about the posture of the heart. And we see that in Ephesians 3, 8, where Paul equates the reception of God's grace with him being the very least of all the saints. God doesn't give grace to people who think they're the best Christian. (laughs) He gives grace to people who recognize their weakness. And there's a, there's a point of clarity I think we have to address here, and that is, um, is it awkward to you that the Apostle Paul calls himself, because saint just means Christian, I'm the very least, I'm the worst of all Christians? I'm like, Paul, I don't know, foundation of the church, apostle, I think you're doing pretty good. If you're the worst, then I'm worse than you. <laughs> you know, like, how could he say this? But we do know that he's writing by the Holy Spirit, so he's speaking about how he truly feels about the situation. When we look at his letter to Timothy, he calls himself the chief of sinners there because he persecuted the church of God, so maybe he's got his past uh, in mind there. But either way, he truly feels this, and I think it's important to distinguish that this is not an issue of self-abasement. This is not an issue of self-hatred, and that there is a world of difference between humility and and self-hatred. Paul calling himself the least of all the saints is not an issue of self-hatred. And um, I want to show you a chart that I think will help uh, maybe bring this to light. Okay, can we pull that, uh, that chart up? Has anyone ever seen this chart before? Okay, I read about it some years ago. So this is just, as time is progressing, uh, you've got your moment of conversion. And real early in the Christian life, you have minimal awareness of God's holiness and your need for forgiveness, Um, but you have some, enough to ask God for forgiveness, enough to repent of your sins, but it's very early on. But as you progress in your friendship with Jesus, what happens is the closer you get to the light, the more aware you are of the darkness inside of you. And so that's what's happening with the Apostle Paul. He's toward the end of his life here. He's become more aware of God's goodness, of God's light, of God's holiness. It has exposed his own unholiness. But then look at the middle there. As you progress, as you grow in a friendship with Jesus, the more you realize your need for grace. Think of that cross as grace. What's happening here with Paul, this is not self-hatred. Self-hatred says, I'm a nobody, and therefore I'm disqualified. That's not what Paul says. Humility says, I'm a nobody, but God loves me anyway, and therefore I'm qualified. In this passage, in the very same breath that Paul says, I'm the least of all the saints, he says, I'm an apostle in the foundation of the church. So I'm a nobody who's eminently qualified by the love of Jesus. (laughs) Maybe you need to tell yourself this week, I'm a nobody who's eminently qualified because Jesus loves me. You see, what's happened is that Paul, and this is the difference with self-hatred, Paul does not find his worth in his goodness, but in God's goodness. Not in his merits, but in God's grace. Where do you find your worth? And the last question based on this illustration, how big is your cross? As in the cross that fills that middle section, how big is your cross? Because I have a feeling there are people in the room 
you have a tremendous awareness of that bottom line, a tremendous awareness of your badness, but not God's goodness. That's self-hatred. And strangely, self-hatred is actually a form of pride, like all the self-sins, self-indulgence, self-accolade, self-love, self-obsession. Self-hatred is in a form of self-obsession because it's obsessed with how bad that I am. And, and my heart for you, my heart for you is I want you to persevere. I want you to finish well in whatever season it is, whatever it is that you're called to do. But as long as your focus is on yourself, your tank won't be full. My encouragement would be 2 Corinthians chapter 12. As soon as God says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect in weakness, Paul goes on to say, well, therefore I delight in weakness, insult, hardship, tribulation, because then I'm weak, then I'm, in, then I'm strong. What would it look like in your life if you actually thanked God for areas of weakness because they were opportunities to rely more on God's grace? God doesn't fill tanks that are full just like you don't. When your gas tank is full, do you go ahead and just fill it up just because? He fills tanks that are empty. And honestly, I think this is a message for all of us, not just those who struggle with self-hatred, those who are weary for whatever reason. My encouragement to you is that weakness isn't as bad as it might seem. <laughs> the weaker you feel, the easier it is to be humble, to admit that you have a need, to posture yourself to receive God's grace. So if you're feeling tired this morning, I would encourage you, don't make a hasty decision in a hard time. Pause and consider your trajectory. Is my purpose aligned with God's purpose? Is my heart aligned with his eternal purpose, first of all? And second of all, am I serving, am I, uh, am I working and operating in my own strength or am I doing it out of weakness but reliance upon the strength and grace that God supplies? Rethink some of those questions and the encouragement to you. And part of the benefit of the gospel, part of the good news of the gospel is that there is always sufficient grace. Grace that is in proportion to what Paul calls the unsearchable riches of Christ. Grace that is in proportion to the power that raised Jesus from the dead. The only qualification for receiving this grace is admitting that you need it.